Here is an FRQ question, also non-calculator. Try to focus more on the non-calculator ones because when you take the actual test, you'll be doing four without your calculator and only two with your calculator. So the non-calculator ones are definitely uh, the majority. And what I have here is a question that is a curve analysis combined with a fundamental theorem of calculus, which are two very common themes on the AP test. And actually, I'm going to do another video with another one just like this because they tend to show up every year. They're very visual-based and they'll ask you a lot of similar questions. So we're going to walk, go all the way through this one and try to talk about what you're looking for, point value here. Um, my opinion is part A is going to be worth three points because they're asking you to find three things. So they're always going to do one point per thing. And that's going to leave two points for every part after that, two for B, two for C, and two for D. So this particular question gives you a picture of the graph of F uh, over a region going from negative 3 to 9. And it tells you that G of X is equal to the integral from 0 to X of F of t. First thing you want to do with a problem like this when you see this statement being made is write down the relationship between g and f because you know you're going to use that multiple times. So if g of x equals the integral from 0 to x of f of t, then the fundamental theorem of calculus says when I derive g of x and take the derivative of an integral, I get f of x. And then to go one step further, g double prime of x is equal to f prime of x. This is something you want to write right at the beginning so that you can refer to it the entire problem. So as it's asking you to do different things with g and with f, you know which equation to look at and you know what the picture is supposed to be helping you do. So for part a, we need to go through and find 4.5 into g, g prime, and g double prime. So I'm going to write over here again that relationship that the g prime equals f of x and the g double prime equals f prime. And that's going to help me a lot with part A. So part A wants g of 4.5. So I'm going to do them one at a time. This one's actually going to take me the longest of the three things they're asking me to find. g of 4.5 wants you to plug 4.5 into the integral as the upper boundary. So it's what it's really asking you is what is the integral from 0 to 4.5 of f of t. This is an area question. They're asking you an inter a definite integral. You have a picture that goes with it, so you're doing this geometrically. This is saying, what is the area from 0 to 4 and a half, which is where that crosses the axis? So you need to split it up into shapes that you can work with. So I'm going to work like this. I'm going to split it up right here, and I'm going to work with a trapezoid right here and a triangle right here. Make sure when you're doing this problem in the AP test that you write the integral that I just wrote. You don't just want to write an answer and not show that you understand that it is an integral that you are finding. So at that point, once I write the integral, now I'm going to turn into a geometry problem. My trapezoid has an area of 1 half. The height goes from 0 to 3, so that is 3. And then the two bases are 4 and a half and 3. So I'm going to write it as fractions because I can't use a calculator and I don't really want to multiply decimals in my head. So what I end up getting is a half times 3 is 3 halves, and then 9 halves plus 3, 3 is 6 halves, plus 9 halves is 15 halves. So I end up getting an area of the trapezoid of 45 fourths. And then when I look at the triangle that's next to it that goes from 3 to 4 and a half, it is 1 half base times height. So my base is 1 and a half, so I'm going to write it as 3 halves. My height is 3. So I get 9 fourths. So my total area when I add them together is going to be 9 fourths plus 45 fourths, which is 54 fourths. If you want to reduce it to 27 halves, if you want to write it as 13.5, any of those answers, as long as it is equivalent to 13 and a half, would be given full credit. That is one point, and to me, the toughest point of part A. Part, uh, the second part of A wants to know g prime of 4.5. This one is not going to take nearly the amount of work because all that's really asking is what is f of 4.5. Reading my graph, f of 4.5 right here, I already have it marked, is 0. That would be one point. And then the last piece, also pretty easy, g double prime of x. So I want f prime of 4.5. So I should probably put a 4.5 in here. G double prime of 4.5 is equivalent to F prime of 4.5, which is really just asking you the slope at 4.5. So looking at this segment, 
figuring out the slope. I just did it from a counting point of view. That segment goes down to right 1, so it has a slope of negative 2. So part A, normally when you see these problems on the AP test, tend to be one point per piece of information that you're asked to find. So this would be worth three points. They are all separate from each other. So if you get two of the three pieces right, then you get two of the three points. Part B wants to find the average value uh, from on the interval from negative 3 to 5 and show the work that leads to your answer. So the first thing I want to write down is what average value is. So average value is my area from negative 3 to 5, so I really want to get in the habit of writing that as an integral. It's the integral from negative 3 to 5 of my function. That's my area, and then I'm going to divide that by 8, or I'm going to multiply it by 1 eighth, because that is the width of my interval. That's what average value is. It's the area divided by the width. You may even want to write that down. It is area divided by width. So I need to find the area, and when I'm done, I need to divide that by 8. So my area, I've already done part of it, so you can use what you've done, or you can split it up into different shapes. Um, I'm going from negative 3 to 5. So I'm going to go from negative 3 to positive 3 and just have one huge trapezoid. And then I'm going to go from 3 to 4 and have a little trapezoid. And I'm actually not going to worry about these areas from 4 to 5 because they will cancel each other out. So what I'm going to do, and the way I kind of like to write my work is when I go from from negative 3 to 3, I have a trapezoid. My trapezoid will be 1 half. The um, height of my trapezoid is 6, because I'm going from negative 3 to 3. And my two bases are 6 and 3, so a little easier numbers to work with. So I get half of 6, which is 3. 3 times 9, I get 27. And then I'm going to go from... 3 to 4 and have another trapezoid, much smaller trapezoid. This one is 1 half. This trapezoid has a height of 1 and my bases are 1 and 3. So I end up with half of 4, which is 2. From 4 to 5, and I am going to write it down. I don't know if it's something they would look for because there's so many other points to be earned here. But from 4 to 5, my areas would cancel out because they have the exact same triangle above the axis as it is below the axis, so one's positive and one's negative, so that will not impact my average value because that area, that region has an area of uh, an average value of zero because we're thinking about average height. So what I have is I have 29, which were my areas added together, and then I'm going to divide by 8. Um, that fraction will not reduce. Even if it could reduce, you don't need to to get full credit. All you would have to have is 29 eighths or anything equivalent to that to get that point. Um, this problem, this part B is probably worth two points. Uh, one for demonstrating your understanding of average value. Really that first thing that I wrote down, that it's the integral from negative 3 to 5 of my function and then divided by 8 or times 1 eighth. And then one point for getting the numeric answer correct of 29 eighths or anything equivalent to that. Part C wants to find any x-coordinates of the point of inflection and then to justify why they are points of inflection. So first thing I'm going to write down is for this to happen, I need my second derivative to equal 0 or to be undefined, which means that my f prime of x has to equal 0. What you're really looking for visually is you're looking for places where you have a minimum or a maximum on this graph, because that would give you a zero derivative or an undefined derivative. And the reason I mention undefined is because that's actually what happens. The only place that that happens is right here at x equals 5. Um, I do have one kind of point that comes into contention is x equals 3. You do have an undefined derivative there. However, that does not end up being a place where we have a point of inflection because my derivative actually has to change signs. So I have to go from a positive to a negative or a negative to positive to create this um, changing uh, point of inflection. So my only point of inflection is x equals 5, and I can show you what I wrote to justify it. I said that is the place where f prime of x, and again, be specific, don't just say the function, switches from, it goes from negative, because it's a decreasing slope, to positive. 
And that's all you have to say for the justification. Um, this part I also would say would be two points. You're showing that you realize that it happens at five, and then your reason. And use the pluses and minuses and the correct function to help you. If your derivative switches from positive to negative, and that or negative to positive, and that represents the second derivative switching from negative to positive. So you also could have said this. You don't have to say f prime. You also could have said that means g double prime switches from negative to positive, because f prime and g double prime are one and the same, that tells me that I have a point of inflection of g. And they did not want the y value. Um, you wouldn't have enough information to find that. They only want an x coordinate, because we don't have the original function to find a y value. And then part D, to me part D is the toughest part of this problem, even though it doesn't take as much work as part A did. Um, D would be the one, if you're going to miss some points on here and you're doing really well up into this point, this is probably where you're going to miss maybe a point. Um, I, when I did this problem the first time, I had got 8 out of 9, in my opinion, of the scoring, because there's one piece at the end that's easy to leave out that we don't consider. Um, first, we'll go through what we're looking for to have a maximum point. In order to have a maximum point, I need g prime of x t equals 0. And for that to happen, I need f of x to equal 0. Because g prime of x is equivalent to f of x from that relationship you wrote at the very beginning of the problem. So now it comes from a visual standpoint. If I look at my original function, when is it equal to 0? And it happens right here at 4 and a half. It does not ask you to justify, but to show that it really is a maximum, we can show that g prime, or f of x, which are the same thing, switches from positive to negative at that value. So it is a maximum. Or you could say that um, my original function goes from increasing to decreasing. That's another thing that we can talk about. Here's where it gets a little tricky. Um, first of all, they want the coordinates. They don't just want the x value. So you actually have to come up with a y value, which is not that easy since they don't give you the original function. And because it's a closed interval, that's not the only potential maximum point. So the last part of this problem is very difficult to get all nine points. Um, first of all, to find the coordinates, what that means is if you put 4.5 into g, so if you figure out g of 4.5, that is actually what you did in part A. That was part of what you did in part A. Now, the nice thing is you already got this answer. You did this in part A, and you got an answer of 27 halves. So the coordinates that they were looking for isn't just x equals 4.5. It's actually 4.5 comma 13.5, or 27 halves. That is your coordinates of your maximum. Now, it's not, obviously, you already got the 27 halves in part A. That's not the hard part. The hard part is realizing that you have to find, write that value down. I know my tendency is always just write, well, it's x equals 4.5, because we oftentimes, when there's just a picture, don't write the y value. The other thing that's hard about this piece is when you are looking at a closed interval, and this particular problem is looking at the interval from negative 3 all the way until 9 you have the potential of having your maximums and minimums also occur at the endpoints. And what you want to look at with this graph is when you get to 9, you still have a positive slope. So your function is still increasing, which means that you actually have what's called an endpoint maximum. So you also have to consider what would happen at 9. So when you're looking at x equals 9, what that's actually saying for g is what's the integral from 0 to 9 of this function, or not from 0 to 9, you're going from, well, you are going from 0 to 9 of this function. And what that means is you are looking at what happened from 0 to 4 and a half, which we already did. From 0 to 4 and a half, we get, um, let me write this down, from 0 to 4 and a half of my f of t. I got 27 halves. And then we want to see, well, what happens when we go from 4 and a half to 9? From 4 and a half to 9, we have these two triangles. Uh, this triangle would be 1 half base times height. Uh, the base of it would be 2 and a half, so 5 halves. And the height of it would be 1. So we get 5 fourths, but it is negative because of where it's located. And then this triangle, 1 half base times height, be 1 half 2 times 1, 
which is 1. So if we take negative 1 and a quarter plus 1, we get this inter integral to be represented by negative a quarter, negative 1 fourth. And then we could say that we had 13.5 minus 0.25 giving me a value of 13.25, so we have a maximum at 9, comma, 13.25. That's the point that I rarely get when I do these. Now, I've seen these a little bit before, so I'm starting to get better at re recognizing it. Um, now, you might look at that and go, but that's not as high as the other one. Well, it didn't ask for the absolute. The absolute maximum would be at 4.5 and, and 27 halves, or 4.5 and, and 13.5. But because the endpoint, because you're still increasing, you can also call that endpoint a maximum and you know, not a relative maximum, not an absolute maximum. And if you don't consider that as an option, they will not give you that final point. So I don't know how picky they would be on the actual coordinates themselves for this. Um, they have the potential, really, at this point particular problem, you could end up making this e worth even more points, but then you'd have to take some points away from one of the other parts. So I think Part D is very challenging, not necessarily finding that 4.5, that's not bad at all, but realizing that you need to use the picture to come up with a Y coordinate, and realizing that on a closed interval, you also have to think about what's going on in the end, and is it still on the increase, which would create a maximum, or is it still on the decrease, which would create a minimum. So that is this problem, um, definitely a challenging problem, one that I hope that when you look at, you can get at least 5 out of 9. If you're getting six, seven, eight out of nine, then you're in very good shape.